Good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be here on the uh, traditional territory of the Lekongan speaking people, the Songhees Nisquamalt First Nation. I'm joined today by my colleague Adrian Dix, Minister of Health, Dr. Bonnie Henry, our Provincial Health Officer, and Dr. Penny Ballam, who's joining us on the immunization response team. It has been uh, a year Monday since the first case of COVID-19 was identified here in British Columbia. And I know for all British Columbians, this has been an unprecedented year of hardship for many, an unprecedented year of grief, and for all of us, extraordinarily challenging as we've met a global pandemic head on, together, focused on making sure that we're keeping our most vulnerable citizens safe, and all of us working forward to that day when we can get back to something resembling normal. And although the pandemic has hit us all very, very hard, it has not hit us equally. Over the past uh, six weeks, we have been able to immunize 100,000 British Columbians, starting us on the road to putting COVID-19 in our rearview mirror, but we are far from off the track. We have a long, long way to go. And today we're gonna talk about how we as British Columbians can all work together to get to that objective that we all share of a province free of COVID-19 where we can get back to where we want to be as individuals, as families, as communities, and as a province. At the outset, I want to also thank the countless numbers of frontline workers, whether they be in our healthcare sector, whether they be in on supply chains and logistics to get food to our tables and to protect people in our communities day after day, week after week, month after month as we've struggled through COVID-19. Today, I'm very, very happy to announce that the plan forward is one that will put 4.3 million British Columbians in a vaccinated situation by the end of September. Dr. Henry and public health experts have designed a plan that will make sure that we do everything we can to follow the science, to protect those most vulnerable, and focus on saving lives. At every step, our plan puts the health and safety of those most at risk first. Everyone in British Columbia, as I said, has been affected by the pandemic, but we are not all equally vulnerable to the virus. And the science is very clear. The single biggest factor for death or severe illness is age. Someone over, over the age of 60 is five times more likely to be seriously ill or die than someone under 45. And that means no matter where you work, no matter what you do, your age is the predominant factor, and that's been the focus of the development of this plan. As I said, in December, we started vaccinating long-term care residents and the people who care for them. Most of them are severely at risk, and that's why we started there. The next phases of our plan will follow this very simple principle. Beginning in late February, where more vaccine comes available, we will be moving to the next phase, and Dr. Henry and Dr. Ballin will talk about that. In March, we'll start to uh, ensure that those that are eligible will be able to pre-register based on age to get access to the vaccine. And then when we get into April, the general population will mean large scale vaccination programs across the province where we'll utilize our arenas, our convention halls, our community centers to make sure that we can get everyone who wants a vaccination, a vaccination. In some rural areas, we may well use uh, mobile teams to ensure that we can get to everyone in every corner of British Columbia. So that by the end of September, everyone who wants a vaccination will have one and the community immunity that we're all striving for will be a reality. And it needs to be very, very clear that this plan depends on a consistent supply of vaccine. That vaccine has been disrupted and next week and the week after will be a challenge for us based on what we had anticipated to receive from the federal government and what they're able to provide us. But I want to say at the outset, blaming anyone for that is not helpful. Blaming the federal government will not get one more vaccination delivered in British Columbia. I believe the federal government is the appropriate body to, to procure vaccine for the entire country. That was agreed on by all premiers from across the country, coast to coast to coast, and that is what we're doing. We've run into a, a snaggle in Europe. That's a problem not for the federal government. That's a problem for Canadians. And we need to stand fast and ensure that we get the vaccines we deserve, that we paid for, and get them into people's arms as quickly as possible. When shipments be begin to arrive of new vaccines that have not yet been approved, that will allow us to amend the plan. And again, Dr. Henry will talk about that in a moment. 
But I want to just reinforce, and we see this in the United States with the emergence of a new federal government and the election and the inauguration of uh, President Joe Biden, that science is taking the front row again in the United States. British Columbians have always been focusing on the science, making sure that experts are giving advice to Minister Dix, myself, and our entire team to make sure we put the health and safety and wellness of British Columbians front and center all day, every day. And so to keep with that, I want to uh, ensure that uh, we're going to be making sure that you get what you need, but you also need to do your part. You need to continue to follow public health guidelines. Those have been challenging for some, but they have produced positive results for British Columbians. We need to continue to do that. We need to continue to wear our masks. We need to continue to make sure we're staying at distance from people, particularly vulnerable populations. We follow those directions. We get our immunizations, and British Columbia will be back to where we want it to be. And with that, I'll ask Dr. Henry to come up and begin the presentation, and she'll be followed by uh, Dr. Ballum. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, so today I have the pleasure of talking about our uh, BC's COVID-19 immunization plan, our strategy to roll out what is the largest immunization program in our history. Today we'll be outlining uh, this plan uh, to make the COVID-19 vaccine available to all eligible people living in BC who want to be vaccinated by the end of September. And focusing today on the plan that will start in April when we move to that mass vaccination, that population protection phase of our plan. There are approximately 4.3 million eligible people in British Columbia. And right now, the vaccines that we have require two doses. So that is 8.6 million immunizations that need to be done in the next few months. We will do this based on age starting with our oldest citizens first, who are most at risk, as we know and what we have seen for the past year, and going through to our young adults in the province. Today we're setting out an approximate timeline of when you can expect to be vaccinated. We'll be establishing clinics around at uh, about 172 communities all around British Columbia. They will be set up in March by health authorities in partnership with local communities, municipalities, businesses, volunteers. This is going to be and needs to be an all of BC effort to make sure that we can protect those most vulnerable and then everybody in our communities. As mentioned, we'll also be using mobile sites where necessary and home visits to support those who are unable to go to clinics. And we'll be undertaking a province-wide communication effort to make sure people are informed about these clinics. And in March, you'll have the opportunity to pre-register, to sign up for appointments, um, which uh, based on age, through your mobile device, computer, or by phone. So we know that the, the Government of Canada has committed that every Canadian who wants to be vaccinated will have access to vaccine by the end of September. To date, we've done over 100,000 people in British Columbia, those who are most vulnerable to severe illness or to um, death from vaccine. And most of them have received their first dose, and we now have several thousand who have received their second dose. The COVID vaccines that we have in Canada that have been approved by Health Canada, we know are safe and effective and save lives. To date, we uh, have two, dose, uh, two vaccines, the, the, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, both of which require two doses. And our mass immunization program, um, the population protection program that will be starting in April, is based on these vaccines and what we have been committed to receive here in British Columbia over the next few months. So it starts with, uh, we have uh, six million doses of vaccine for quarter one from January to March. And we did receive early access to some of this vaccine in December. And we started our immunization programs in December. But that, that is early um, access to the same amount of vaccine that uh, Canada has uh, expect um, between now and the end of March. Starting on the 1st of April in quarter two, we expect to receive 20 million doses of vaccine and in quarter three, 45 million doses. So our plan is based on these expectations. 
Um, for us here in British Columbia, that has meant from December until the end of March, we expect to receive just under 800,000 doses of vaccine. And then from April to the end of June, another 2.6 million doses. And finally, from June to September, about 6 million doses. As you can see, once again, these are back end loaded. So our plan takes that into account. We also hope and expect that other vaccines will become available as we go through the next few months. Particularly, we know the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a viral vector vaccine, is under consideration by Health Canada. And if and when it comes online, it is a little bit more flexible in that it is a fridge stable vaccine. So we'll be able to add that in addition to the plan that we're um, presenting today. But right now, we're basing it on what we know or what we expect to receive in the next six months here in British Columbia. So as we said, our population to be vaccinated uh, is about 5.2 million people in the province. Right now, none of the vaccines that are in the pipeline or have been approved are approved for use in children under the age of 18. Um, and that's approximately 900,000 young people here in British Columbia. So our population eligible right now is about 4.3 million people. We expect um, as of April 1st that we'll still have about 400, or 4 million people still need to be vaccinated. Um, around 600,000 will be people who receive their first dose uh, between December and March and the balance are people who will need two doses. So that takes us to about 7.4 million doses that we'll need to provide to people in BC between April and September. Our immunization plan is based on evidence and data and focused on immunizing people who are most vulnerable to the virus first. And we know that the single greatest risk factor for severe illness and death from COVID-19 is increasing age. And that increase, that risk increases exponentially after age 70. And we see that every day, every week in our data. The approach that we have increases protection for those with um, very severe risk factors as well, um, as these also increase with age. We have been looking at this question in, in some detail across the country, internationally, and of course here in British Columbia as well. And uh, early on, uh, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization and here in BC, we had um, put out some large groups of people, including essential workers and people who um, need to be uh, at their workplace. We now know that with the way the vaccine will be arriving in British Columbia and in Canada, and with the risk that we're facing, that uh, the most appropriate approach right now to, do, to meet our goals of reducing morbidity and mortality, so sickness and, uh, and death from COVID-19, is to use that overriding risk factor of age. We know that adults older than 60 have at least five times increased risk of hospitalization and death compared to those less than 45 years of age. And in particular, people over 80 have double the mortality risk of even those in the 60 to 65 year age group. Using uh, British Columbia data, we've looked at all of the different aspects. We know that people with single risk factors like um, diabetes, like chronic kidney disease, high blood pressure, ischemic heart disease, COPD, are more likely to have a more severe illness. But that is compounded by age. And when we look at our population, the probability of having those underlying chronic condition also goes up with age. And we can see from the data here in British Columbia, both the proportion and the numbers of people with chronic underlying medical conditions is also highly associated with age. The one uh, that is the most associated with younger uh, age groups is asthma, but we do know that it's actually severe uncontrolled asthma that is the greatest risk and that is one that goes up with age. And when we looked at this data and put it into uh, models here in British Columbia, using the hospitalization data that we have here, we know that there is slightly increased risk with a number of these underlying conditions, but overriding all of that is the risk with age. So going in an age-based model captures the majority of people with underlying risk factors um, first. 
So here we have uh, the age bands that we have here in British Columbia. As you can see, we have a quarter of a million people who are aged 80 or over in this province. Many of them uh, will be, or a proportion of the group will be people who live in, in assisted living and long-term care, who will be covered in phase one. But we have a large group of community dwelling seniors who will need to be um, provided with vaccination as soon as we're able to. And that group of people will be eligible later in February. Um, we were hoping it would be earlier, but now it's going to be later in February and into March. And with the, the shift in not providing first doses in, uh, in February because of the delay from the Pfizer vaccine in particular, we are looking at into the later part of March, hopefully being able to start immunization in people in the 75 to 80 year cohort as well. We will be doing it by birth cohort, which means people born in the birth year of 1941 and earlier would be the first people eligible uh, to receive vaccine starting in uh, late February and early March and going down from there. And I'll now uh, turn it over to Dr. Ballum um, to provide some more details about the plan as we move forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Henry and Mr. Premier. Um, what I'm going to do is just walk you through a little bit more detail about this high-level phase plan. And as I'll share with you, there will be more detail coming in the coming weeks. There will be four phases for immunization. And as you've heard, based on expert advice and guidance from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, BC's Immunization Committee, and public health leadership. It is based primarily on age and focused on protecting people most susceptible to severe illness and death from COVID. Focus of phase one and two is protecting those most vulnerable to severe illness first, and then phase three and four on vaccinating the rest of the broad public. We are currently in phase one, which started in December and will continue to the end of February. Phase two, February to the end of March. Phase three, April to June. And phase four from July to September. And of course, these phases may vary a little bit depending upon flows of vaccine, but this is a very good platform to start from to get ourselves organized. So really, phase one and two are the high risk population and phase three and four, the broader general population. So what I'm going to do in, in the next few minutes is just walk you through the details of these four phases. Um, this is a summary slide, but I'll take the next slide and just start you with the details of phase one. This is the current phase we're in, and I think you're aware we started in December 2020, and it will be ongoing through to likely the end of February. And we have had two approaches in this part First, to protect residents and staff of long-term care facilities, of assisted living residences. As you heard from Dr. Henry, these are our highest, most vulnerable risk patients. We also have individuals who are, individuals who are also vulnerable and, and frail waiting for long-term care. And essential visitors who are coming into our long-term care homes, our assisted living homes, to actually help their, their loved ones and family members. Um, be cared for and and have the you know the the ne necessary care throughout the day. The other aspect of this first phase has been protecting our healthcare system and protecting in, in order of priority our healthcare workers and and medical staff who are basically caring for COVID patients requiring admission to hospital. So settings like intensive care units our emergency departments, and in the, the number of hospitals across the province that we have established as our COVID treatment hospitals, we have special COVID boards on those units. And then following on our paramedics, our broad medical surgical units in our acute care hospitals. And the other part um, of this first phase is vaccinating our First Nations residents in remote and isolated Indigenous communities. Because as you've heard from Dr. Henry, our First Nations have a higher risk for, according to, you know, even when compared by age. 
and when they're living in remote and isolated communities and become ill, um, it is a logistical challenge to ensure that they get to, to safety. So that, that in essence is phase one, which is still underway. And our hope is that vaccine supply, um, you know, pending, uh, that we will be able to finish that up uh, toward the end of February. Moving on to phase two, which is February to the end of March. In this part of the phase, we will be able to reach out to the 80 plus age group who have not yet been immunized in phase one. And these are people that are, you know, in independent living and uh, living in community, in homes with their family or even on their own. So that will be the first population, broad population group that we will be looking at for immunization. Um, we will carry on with uh, immunization of Indigenous seniors age 65 and over and Indigenous elder, elders and additional Indigenous communities that we were not able to get to in phase one that are isolated and remote. Um, we will continue to immunize hospital staff that have been working in some of the, the lower risk areas of our acute care system our GPs and medical specialists, nurse practitioners who are working in the community who have not yet been immunized in phase one. There are vulnerable populations uh, living in congregate settings, um, living in shelters, uh, and those kinds of very vulnerable um, situations that we will also be working to cover off with vaccination and staff in community home support and our nurses who are going into individual homes across our province in our home support and home care programs. So this is phase two. Moving on to phase three, this is when we will start to broaden our reach into the general population. So from April to June, as Dr. Henry has outlined in age increments, we will start with people aged 60 to 79 in five year increments. 79 to 75 will approximately, they'll get their first shot in April and their second dose following five weeks later in May. 74 to, uh, 70 to 74, first shot in April, same thing, second dose in May. When we get to the 65 to 69 year age group, we will be shifting Probably half of them will get their first dose in May or June and their, and their second shot five weeks later in June and July. And for those 60 to 64, we will likely not get to them until June. They'll get their first shot in June and they will be running for their uh, second shot in July. We will also be looking at a group of people um, age 16 to 69 who are considered extremely clinically vulnerable and we will be lining them up with the, the group aged, you know, 70 to 79 and, and perhaps younger as we try and reach though that group of individuals through this early phase of phase three. And as additional vaccines are approved and particularly ones that are, have less logistical constraints in terms of how they need to be stored and how readily they can be transported, that's when we may be able to look at people between the ages of 18 and 64, particularly the frontline essential workers or who work in specific high risk workplaces or industries that we may be able to include starting them off in phase three and that's still to be determined. I just want to walk you through our clinically extremely vulnerable patients. I think that Dr. Henry has outlined that vulnerability does increase with age and with chronic disease, but this is a group of specific individuals who have been solid organ transplant recipients who continue to be taking immuno, very immunosuppressive medications, people with specific cancers who are undergoing active systemic chemotherapy or, for example, people with lung cancer who are receiving radiation to their, to their lung people with bone marrow and blood cancers who have received bone marrow transplantation or at any stage of treatment for those conditions, people who are receiving immunotherapy designed to suppress their immune system for treatment of cancer or other antibody treatments for cancer that are more common nowadays, and other, other targeted cancer treatments, some of our designer drugs for cancer that have specific immunosuppressive um, activities, 
And people who have had a transplant in the last six months, a bone marrow transplant for treatment of either uh, a blood type cancer or even solid organ uh, cancer such as breast cancer and others who continue to take immunosuppressive drugs. There are people with respiratory conditions, um, including such things as cystic fibrosis, severe asthma, and severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease who are you know, really recurrently being admitted to hospital and are difficult to manage. These are a group of patients that we will want to protect. There are rare diseases such as combined severe immunodeficiency, um, homozygous sickle cell disease, which we're fortunate we have very few patients with that in this province, but these are conditions associated with significant immune suppression. There are a number of groups of patients who take very heavy hitting immunosuppression therapies that have been a miraculous step forward in the management of their disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, who are on biologic modifiers that specifically suppress their immune system. High dose steroids, which most people are familiar, are uh, very immunosuppressive drugs such as cyclophosphamide and azathioprine that are, that are used to suppress um, people's immune response with these autoimmune conditions. People have had a splenectomy. Um, that when you remove your spleen, people are much more vulnerable to different kinds of infections. We know from the literature on COVID-19 that adults with significant developmental disabilities can have increased risk and, and more uh, details will come of that particular group. Patients on dialysis or with, you know, pre-dialysis, chronic severe kidney disease, stage five. Women who are pregnant with significant heart disease, we know they appear from our experience across the world to have um, a higher risk of an adverse outcome with COVID. And finally, there are patients with significant neuromuscular conditions who are at respiratory risk from respiratory compromise from their, their neuromuscular ability to, um, in terms of their respiratory status. So a group of patients that range in ages who have a, a particularly unique, uh, serious risk of adverse outcome. And so we will be working with um, different provincial registries and, and specialty clinics to figure out who these individuals are and how we will approach getting them immunized, starting in phase three. Phase four, July to September, you've heard that the vaccine will increase again. And this is where we will you know, immunize people from the age groups of 59 down to 18. And you can see in the slide um, that as, as I've described before, you know, dose one during one month and, and dose two return back for the second dose the following month. And, you know, this will carry on through the summer into September. And we know that by the end of phase four, which is the end of September, where our commitment to have our broad public immunized. There will likely be a few people that will be still waiting for their second dose into October, but generally we will have achieved a, a, a very significant um, level of immunization. So there are some now logistical issues that I just want to go over that will that just describe some of the work ahead to get ready for this very broad immunization campaign. Registration. Starting in mid to late February, we will be working to reach out to our elderly seniors over 80 and our indigenous seniors 65 plus and elders to provide information on how they can pre-register for a, a vaccination appointment. And we'll be providing an update on this process in the coming weeks. And the communication plan that will be launched in late February will actually have information of when people can be expected to be vaccinated how and when they can pre-register, and then how they access the vaccination clinic. Enabling pre-registration really allows us to plan better because it allows us to know how to schedule both human resources, supply chain for vaccine, and other supplies that are necessary. So generally, our, our present approach is that individuals will be able to register two to four weeks before they're eligible to have their vaccine and pre-registration for the 79 to 75 age group that will start um, getting their vaccinations in April, we will start that therefore in March, 2021. And because not everybody, and especially in our older age group, uh, we have a lot of very active techno savvy seniors, but there's still some people who are not comfortable 
with using an online registration and there will be a call center, a phone mechanism for them to get assistance with registration. I just want to turn now to partnerships. The partnerships um, that I'm going to just refer to are going to be essential and foundational to our ability to mobilize our public and mobilize our communities to help with a successful campaign. And I think the Premier has outlined just how critical it is that our whole province mobilize behind this whole initiative to get us the protection that we need from this virus in order to get back to business and life as usual. We will be leveraging partnerships with other ministries of the provincial government, local governments, nonprofit groups in the community, the private sector, and others to support the plan. They will have facilities that may be important for us for our mass clinics, um, such as local governments and First Nations. Some of our civil society nonprofits have networks to reach subpopulations who require special attention to make sure they understand how to get vaccinated, how to pre-register. We will have other services from partners in the, in the private sector who can provide in-kind help and also skills and, and expertise around certain parts of this initiative. And I think we're very fortunate in this province. We have a legacy of large complex initiatives um, that require involvement of our whole province. Um, and, and, you know, just an example of that is the 2010 Olympic and Paralympic Games where, you know, one of the most complex events in the year um, in, in the world that you have to organize. And we, we have a, a, a huge legacy of people who volunteered for that, private sector businesses who took part in organizing that, and, and just the people who helped plan that event and, and pull it off. So moving on to our vaccination clinics. The immunization clinics that we will use in phase three and four are, are going to be organized, as Dr. Henry alluded to, in about 172 communities around the province. And those communities have been organized and will be overseen by the local health authorities. And they've been organized to, you know, really be a convenient central location for people to go for their vaccination. And the kinds of clinics we will be holding will include ones in school gymnasiums, in arenas across the province, convention halls, community halls, and any place where we can gather, you know, medium to very large uh, groups of people to do this. There will also be a need for mobile clinics and, and not only just in rural settings, but also in some of our urban settings to, to reach people who are hard to reach, such as in shelters. We've used mobile clinic already in the downtown east side to, to actually vaccinate people close to where they're gathered um, and make it safe and familiar for them. And people who are homebound due to mobility issues. The details around that, those different kinds of approaches will be available in late February and early March. Now, going on to the proof of vaccine, I, I think everybody um, likes to know what, how have they been vaccinated, what vaccine did they receive, what was the date. So everybody who goes through this program will receive a paper copy of their vaccine record. But more importantly, um, they will be able to sign up for the Provincial Health Gateway that will allow them to access their official immunization card in a, in a digital form. And everybody will, will understand that their vaccination record is not dependent on them carrying around that paper card, but that it is in a, a, the provincial data set now where every vaccine for COVID will be registered and accessible, ultimately by the individual themselves, by their physician, and by um, our public health leaders who require that kind of information in order to plan the ongoing uh, control of the pandemic and the history of immunity in the province. So I'm going to turn this back to um, Dr. Henry to wrap up how, where we're going to be at the end of all this. Thanks. Thank you very much. And you've heard us talk about uh, herd immunity or what I prefer to call community immunity. And that is what we're aiming for in British Columbia. This can be reached if the large majority of people in BC choose to be immunized against COVID-19. And from what we've seen so far, this is something the large majority of people in British Columbia want and are willing to do. And we know that every time we immunize somebody, we're helping to save lives. We're protecting those closest to us and our entire community. 
but we are not yet at that point where we can lift the restrictions in long-term care or in our communities. And really important for success in us getting through this next few months is continuing to take the precautions that we know work. And that means staying home when we're sick, getting tested, making sure we're washing our hands, covering our mouth when we cough, wearing masks when we're in indoor public spaces, and maintaining our safe distances. And right now, the importance of not having social gatherings, of following the restrictions that we have in place so that we can bring our numbers down in the community today while we're rolling out this immunization program. I would love it to be happening instantaneously, but the reality is that the vaccines that are available around the world are in limited supply. And we are going to be getting vaccine in a back end loaded way over the next few months, which means we all have to remain vigilant. We need to keep this bargain that we've made with each other, this social contract that we have to keep ourselves, our communities protected through these next few months as we get towards the light, as we start to see um, the time when we will be able to come together again, when we will be able to take our masks off. And that is, it is insight, and I think that's important to recognize as well. Um, we have made it this far, we can do this. We've shown we can do this. And so I call on everybody now to redouble your commitment. We have a plan, we know it's going to take a few months, but we have an end in sight. And now's our time to stay committed to doing what we need to do to stop the transmission of COVID-19 here in British Columbia so we can protect everybody with immunization as it becomes available. So I'm going to stop there and say thank you very much and we're we'll turn it back over to uh, sure. to the yeah, premier. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Henry and Dr. Ballum, uh, for that presentation. Uh, we're Jen's on the microphone. We're happy to uh, answer any questions uh, you may have. Reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to get into the queue if you haven't already done so. We're going to do one question and one follow up today. And starting with a question from Richard Zisman, Global. Thank you. Considering that we've already seen delays with the Pfizer vaccine, why should British Columbians trust that we will be able to get the 7.4 million doses needed in order to implement this plan? Well, as uh, all British Columbians know, we are uh, 30 some million souls in a sea of 7 billion people all seeking protection from COVID-19. Uh, production is underway with Pfizer and Moderna. They are approved in Canada. Other uh, vaccine providers are in process. Uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, a whole host of others are, are in process. We're confident that uh, the, with the, sp the speed with which Pfizer and Moderna came online uh, will be good news for those other uh, companies that are providing or are in the preliminary stages of approvals. So we're confident that Bicep by, well, certainly we're confident by the end of February that the backlog that we're experiencing, the federal government's experiencing with Pfizer will be uh, corrected. Uh, we're going to be getting uh, those uh, shipments that we anticipated for the week of February 1st uh, before the end of March. So we will have a lot of vaccine and uh, a lot of anxious uh, people looking forward to getting those immunizations. And Dr. Ballum and her team will be at the ready to deliver it. I, I say to British Columbians who are concerned about the, the news stories about disruptions in, uh, in the supply coming to Canada and to other jurisdictions, to be patient, to, to be calm, and to focus on uh, following public health orders to keep themselves and their loved ones safe at this point, and uh, have confidence that uh, public officials are doing everything they possibly can to get vaccines into Canada, into British Columbia, and into the arms of British Columbians. Do you have a follow-up, Richard? There no doubt will be people disappointed today, including uh, some frontline workers, police officers, firefighters, teachers, grocery store clerks that were originally mentioned as being in a higher priority group. What do you say to those groups around the frustration they may be feeling today, knowing that they won't be prioritized? 
Well, I, uh, I know uh, how people feel about this. Uh, in almost every sector uh, in the economy, I received mail uh, a couple of inches thick uh, from advocates saying that their particular sector, their particular profession uh, deserved a higher priority. And all of the arguments were very compelling. Every component of our society is important. But the science is pretty clear. Dr. Henry, Dr. Ballam have made that clear today. Age is the, prom that is the dominant determinant factor on severe illness and death. And so we've developed our plan with uh, the expectation that Moderna and Pfizer are the only accesses we have to uh, access points we have to uh, vaccinations and we'll continue with that using the age criteria until such time as that scarcity of supply is changed and then as Dr. Ballam has said we'll amend our program accordingly but age is the determining factor in this instance and and I would just say to British Columbians because I know this is how they feel if given the opportunity to have a vaccination today, knowing that there are other people that are more vulnerable, I am confident that the vast majority of British Columbians would defer their vaccination to protect someone more vulnerable. That's who we are as a, as a society. That's who we are as Canadians. And I know that we will do everything we can to deliver vaccinations to everyone who wants one by the end of September. That's the plan we're on. And we're going to stick with that until uh, more supply comes on stream. And then we'll reassess. Our next question is from Gordon Hoekstra, Vancouver Sun. Well, thank you for taking my question. This is a tech question for Minister Dix. I'm interested to know why this Ernst & Young review of the effect of the pandemic on care homes was not made public and why the government won't answer uh, some basic questions about it, like such as when it started, when it was completed, its terms of reference and cost. Um, so uh, with respect to the latter questions, it... Uh, uh, started in the summer of uh, 2020. It's not a review of care homes. It's a review of the services provided by the Health Services Division, people dealing with care homes in the Ministry of Health. How could we could, could learn from the first phase of COVID-19 to draw lessons for the second phase? The full report's going to be released on Monday. You'll see it Overwhel overwhelmingly, I should say, it's favorable to the performance of the government in the first phase. But it's not a review of care homes or how for-profit care homes or non-profit care homes do or anything like that. It's a review of how we can deliver better services to the care home sector. Its recommendations uh, have been implemented by the staff who were affected by it at the senior services. We did reach out to a lot of people and get their input as to how we can do a better job. And you'll see every detail of it on Monday and draw your own conclusions. Gordon, do you have a follow-up? Why, why wasn't the, the, you know, if it's not a review, then, you know, what, what, is it a, what would you call it? And, and I guess the question again, why wasn't the, the fact of it that it was going on made public? And when was it completed? Well, uh, it, it was public in the sense that I think more than 40 groups uh, were consulted as to the kind of services that uh, were provided. It was intended to inform uh, the Health Services Division of the Ministry of Health, and it did so, and its recommendations were accepted, and it will be released on Monday. Thank you. Our next question is from Justine Hunter, Globe and Mail. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can describe uh, like what scenarios show right now about when we get to take our masks off and when we get to gather again. With this plan now, what should British Columbians expect? Yeah, I think that I, I would love to be able to say um, July 1st. <laughs> That's... Um, you know, I think there's a whole lot of unknowns, and uh, we have a plan, and as we always say, you know, a plan is a basis for change, and it is based on what we know now and what we think is going to happen in the future. It will take, so the concept of community immunity means that there's, the virus can't find ways to transmit to lots of people in our community. And getting there will mean a large number of our population need to be protected. But we also have other things that we're learning about this virus that act in our favour. We know that it doesn't transmit as easily in the spring and summer months as it does in the winter. And we saw that quite dramatically as we headed into October, November. So I, I do believe believe we will have some leeway. I think what is consuming us right now is making sure that those 
areas that we know are most at risk in long-term care and, acute and assisted living are protected. And then we can move on. If we start to bring our numbers down by February, we, you know, that's when the next uh, revision of our orders is potential. Uh, February 5th is when the orders uh, uh, come again. And can, we will be looking at are there things that we can do depending on what we're seeing in transmission risk in the community at that time. So we need to really um, focus on reducing the transmission risk in our community as low as possible because that's what drives uh, outbreaks in long-term care. That's what drives exposure events in schools. That's what drives the risk in, in our social gatherings. And if we can do that, we can start having increased access, uh, social connection again. Um, uh, the, the one wrench in the spanner in the works is the fact that we are now seeing transmission of variants across uh, the world. Um, some of these make the virus more transmissible to others. So the UK variant in particular, we've, we've seen uh, a number of cases here, all of them travel related. We've seen a couple of cases of the South African variant, which are not yet travel, not associated with travel that we can tell. So those are concerning. If we start to see rapid increase again, there's that potential for that with these variants. So this is just um, a way of saying we all have to be really careful right now to reduce the risk of transmission, to stop those chains of transmission. But I am hopeful that once we start getting the most at-risk people immunized, we start having enough people in the population so that it makes it more challenging uh, for the virus to transmit between people. And we know it doesn't transmit as easily in the, in the spring and summer, um, that by the summer we should be able to have some um, types of our, our normal lives back again. Um, but the full um, back to what we would like to have in terms of social interactions and being together is not likely until, uh, until the fall. Justine, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, I do, and thanks for that, Dr. Henry. Premier, you met with your cabinet for four days last week. I'm wondering if you did look at any scenarios, particularly around the economic side of things. When do, for example, you see hospitality and tourism industries starting to rebuild? Um, and I'm just wondering, I, I assume you guys had some scenarios laid out. Do you, do you have an idea of what would be most likely? Well, we had a very, very good working uh, week last week, four full days of cabinet discussion on a range of issues. Uh, I've also been engaging with the tourism sector. Our visitor uh, economy is critical uh, to every corner of British Columbia. Uh, we have a new minister, uh, Melanie Mark, who has been engaging as well with small uh, providers, uh, tourist operators and large scale operators to try and find the best way for the province to work with that sector to uh, keep them going until we can uh, once again welcome uh, people from not just across Canada but from around the world to come back to British Columbia. And, and I'm confident that the relationship we have uh, with leaders in the tourism sector is a positive one. We've amended some of the uh, grant programs that we have in place to meet their needs. That was uh, a high priority for us. Uh, similarly, the Minister of Finance is working on uh, the next budget, and that was the primary focus of our discussions last week. And uh, certainly uh, tourism and the uh, broader economy are uh, absolutely critical to our uh, maintaining our position in Canada as an enviable place to invest and uh, the highest credit rating in the country still. Uh, but we need to work on that. We need to make sure that the programs we put in place make sense. Uh, to our long-term fiscal plans, but also are there to help those vulnerable companies that are just devastated by COVID-19. Our next question is from Lisa Yuzda, News 1130. One question I have for you, Dr. Henry, a, a couple of weeks ago when you were asked about immunizations for the more at-risk population, as in those getting chemo immunotherapy transplants, you said you weren't sure. So I'm wondering, because trials hadn't been run on, on those types of populations, so what have you learned since then, and I'm guessing it's from mass vaccinations in other locations, but what have you learned that you now know that that will be safe? Yeah, so it, it wasn't, um, uh, safety was not the major concern. The concern, of course, was that these uh, uh, these medications, these vaccines had not been tested in people with certain conditions. And so, yes, we, we've been looking at uh, what others have found around the world, the UK, Israel, um, but also the, our National Advisory Committee on Immunization has been reviewing the data in detail from the clinical trials and looking at what we're seeing with immunologists and 
and uh, people who do this for a living around the world. Um, and it, it really is about not under, not knowing if people who have immune compromising conditions will mount as adequate a response. Um, but it is, uh, and we've put this out uh, on the BCCDC website, it really is a, a risk assessment that needs to be made by the individual with their clinician. And uh, the, the one thing we know is that people with immune compromising conditions, uh, severe immune compromising conditions, the ones that we're talking about, do have um, health care providers for the most part. So that's a decision that has to be made. And when we talk about these extremely vulnerable people, they're people that we know are more more at risk of having severe illness and dying from COVID, and that's from what we've seen around the world as well. And we will be reaching out to them through, as, as Dr. Ballam said, through their specialty clinics, through their, their care providers, to make sure that those important conversations can be had. And of course, if, if newer vaccines become available that are more traditional, um, then uh, that we know work uh, effectively uh, in these populations, then we can pivot or, or switch to making sure that they get those vaccines uh, as well. So that's in the back pocket. Um, but right now, these aren't live vaccines, so that's important. They just haven't been studied in many of these groups. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? I do, just tapping on a little bit of what Justine was asking about tourism, but I'm thinking more in the immediate and long-term people wanting to make plans. We've got uh, BC Day coming up, then spring break, and then the big one, summer holidays. So how do you suggest people navigate? Should they not be making plans for the next few months and then they can make plans in summer? I'm just wondering how people navigate what they're supposed to do, what they will be able to do. Yeah, I'll start and then maybe turn it over to the... Premier, um, do not make plans for Family Day. Stay local. Stay in BC. We don't. Uh, we won't be at a place where we can travel. We need to think more about staying in our communities as we're rolling out this program. Uh, we know there are a number of, of celebratory events coming up, like Chinese New Year um, and others, and we need those to remain low-key um, virtual events this year. Once we get to the summer. Um, we're probably going to be in a different position. Uh, whether we'll have uh, access to international travel, that is not as, as sure. Uh, we know that there are, are you know, billions of people who do not have access to immunization and that this virus is still creating um, great risks in many communities around the world. So for people in BC, we need to think for the next few months into the summer that we need to continue what we're doing, essential travel, staying local, looking at experiencing what we have in BC for people in BC. And uh, all I can really add to Dr. Henry's answer is that we'll be guided by the science. Uh, I know that I would very much like to go to a lacrosse game this summer. It's the 150th anniversary of British Columbia joining Confederation, becoming part of Canada. That would be something that we would normally like to celebrate. Uh, but we're not making plans right now, and British Columbians shouldn't make plans right now. We should focus on staying safe, uh, being kind, being calm, and as we get more information as the vaccination program rolls out and we see uh, the impact on case counts and uh, all of the other issues that we've been focused on over the past 12 months, uh, we'll be in a better position to make those decisions. I know with respect to campgrounds, for example, uh, Minister Heyman is working on a plan to make sure that we're ready to welcome British Columbians uh, to uh, celebrate and, uh, and enjoy uh, the, the abundance of BC. Uh, the issues around interprovincial travel, I'm sure I'll get a question on that later on, so I'll just leave that for the moment. But uh, I, I, we will be guided by the advice we get from public health officials and we'll be making decisions in the best interest of all British Columbians. The next question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Hi there. I'm just wondering with regards to kids under 18 not being eligible for the vaccine, is that a concern? And can we actually achieve uh, herd or community uh, immunity without the, that subset being vaccinated? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so right now it's not necessarily a concern in that the evidence still supports that young people are much less likely to get infected and less likely to have severe illness. So that's the good news. Um, yes, they can transmit to others, but again, um, it, the probability is less. Uh, it is very likely that once we have uh, more traditional vaccines, they will be available for, for younger people and we'll be looking at that 
that and watching that carefully. Uh, the reality is that uh, these vaccines have not been approved for use in, in children. They've not been studied in children. The Moderna vaccine right now, they're doing uh, some trials on, on children as young as 12. Um, but our focus is on those who are most likely to have severe illness uh, from, from COVID, and that's where the vaccines... I mean, I think the other side of this is it's, it's really almost miraculous that we have a vaccine that is so effective in older people. So when we were um, worrying and setting up um, our, our programs and uh, thinking about who would be the categories of people who would uh, receive immunization first, so much of it depended on whether the vaccine, what populations the vaccine worked in and it was approved for use in. So if we are looking at influenza, we do target younger people because they have severe illness, but also because they spread it a lot more. This vaccine, the fact that it works as well as it does in older people, is really um, a huge, huge benefit for us because those are the people who are, you know, our seniors and elders are the people who are suffering the most from this virus. And to be able to protect them is, uh, is the focus of the vaccine program and is what is going to make the biggest difference in the short term. So we will continue to follow uh, the, the science uh, and the data around younger people. Um, but right now, uh, the focus is on protecting those who are most at risk. Bender, do you have a follow-up? I do, um, and this is for Minister Dix. Uh, on the Ernst & Young report, stakeholders were told that they would see the report. Why haven't they been given a copy, and when did you actually receive it? So the, co the report was prepared in the fall, I think, uh, in... Uh, end of October, the beginning of November, that was when it was completed. It was intended to inform uh, the ministry and they in fact used it for that purpose. And we'll be sharing it with everyone. You'll see that when you see the report that it, it's focused on the Ministry of Health and how it can provide better services. With respect to care home and care home outbreaks, it should be said that our health authorities regularly do uh, reviews of every single outbreak in order to address in fact, issues of infection control. Those are not issues that Ernst & Young would be dealing with. So this is a report uh, designed to improve the services of the Ministry of Health. You'll see that when you get it, as will everybody else. Our next question is from Prabhjot Sohal, Red FM. Good morning. My question is that uh, currently uh, there are some news coming from CDC that they have changed some strategy and they're saying that in exceptional circumstances and there might be a switch to another vaccine for the second dose. And the similar news has come from the UK. I understand that there's lack of clinical data to support this sort of mix and match. But is the province considering something similar and what sort of exceptional circumstances could these be? Have you received any information from a national advisory on this? Yes, this is something that we have been talking about with uh, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization for a number of weeks. And, and of course, the fact that the, some of the Pfizer vaccine has been delayed um, made that a more urgent question. Uh, my counterparts on the Special Advisory Committee across Canada, we've had discussions on this with NACI over the last three weekends. Um, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization is looking at, re-looking at all of the data that we have available. Uh, we're talking to our counterparts in the UK and Israel in particular, who are far ahead with a, lo a number of their programs. And uh, as we know in the UK, they have um, uh, extended the, the second dose for longer, th for up to three months. So we're trying to understand uh, the impact that that has on effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, there, there is some permissive language around using the same type of vaccine um, and if you need to, to uh, replace, uh, for example, Moderna with Pfizer. Um, because they're both mRNA vaccines, they use the same technology, um, biologic plausibility and the, uh, the uh, the work that uh, we know about immune systems and how they're stimulated means that they're likely to be interchangeable. But that is a last resort. Uh, it's not, it's only if 
the uh, original vaccine is not available, um, that we would do that. So we are still looking for the best advice on that and whether it's better to extend uh, the second dose, uh, delay the second dose for longer or to provide the second dose with, a, with the alternate product. Um, right now we don't have good information to inform one or the other of those decisions and we'll be continuing to monitor that and to, to consult on that. We have another call this Sunday about that very issue. Prabhupada, do you have a follow-up? Yes, and I just wanted some clarity that when they say exceptional circumstances, what could those be except the delays in our supply? What could those exceptional circumstances be? Yeah, so if we're at uh, 42 days and there is no Pfizer vaccine available for second doses, we have to make a decision about whether we use available doses of Moderna or whether we extend and wait for Pfizer to become available. So that's the issue, that's the situation that uh, we're not yet in, but that we may be facing. Um, and which is the better of those two to, to do? Um, the, there's no, not a lot of, of evidence or data to guide that. So we're uh, looking at expert opinion and is there some populations where you would prefer to delay and other populations where you would uh, prefer to give uh, a second dose with a different vaccine product. So I'm thinking uh, elderly residents of long-term care, for example, it may be more important for them to get their second dose in a shorter time frame. So in that case, would we rather, would it be preferable to give them, would it be safer for, for them to receive a dose of Moderna rather than wait an extended period of time for Pfizer? Whereas younger, healthier people who mount a stronger immune response to start with, it may be preferable to uh, extend the delay um, to receiving a second dose. All very uh, challenging questions that we deal with in immunization programs. Um, sometimes, I mean, the one other situation that we run into all the time is people don't know what their first dose is. Um, so they can't really, they don't know whether they got Pfizer or Moderna in this case. Right now, that's, that's not as much big a deal, but as we go into uh, population um, immunization with large numbers of people, that may be more important. And that's why some of our focus is on having our immunization registry where we can tell exactly which vaccine everybody got and which lot number which is part of our safety um, profiles as well. So those are the situations that we're dealing with. I mean, this is the reality of, uh, of planning um, and being able to be flexible and trying to use the best information we have uh, to make uh, the best choices that we can in the different circumstances. Next question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Go ahead, Tanya. Uh, it looks like Tanya has actually left the queue. So okay. we're going to move on to Mary Griffin with Czech News. Go ahead, oh. please, Mary. Well, thanks very much. Um, mine just, uh, my first question concerns uh, seniors. Um, uh, Minister Dix, uh, you addressed this in a previous briefing about um, the issue of uh, essential visitors and long-term care facilities. And I've been contacted by many family members who have been refused that designation um, by the facility. And yes, there is an appeal process, but looking at the um, phases for when they can expect the vaccine, it could be many months before the appeal is heard by the Patient Care Quality Board and when they will actually get to see their loved ones. And then also I've been contacted by family members who are concerned about their um, family members who are elderly and living in facilities where they may be living independently but and not receiving the vaccine and having dinner next to someone who is um, uh, not as mobile as they are but are actually receiving the vaccine today. And I'm just wondering about those two issues. I'll deal with the second issue first. As you're aware, uh, um, some uh, 650 people have passed away in long-term care uh, from COVID-19. I think the number in assisted living is between 10 and 20, which is obviously very serious. And the number in independent living is much smaller than that, is uh, I think as few as three. So obviously there's different levels of risk and that is in this early phase when we have very little vaccine, we've been focused on long-term care because those are the, that's the population uh, with their caregivers 
protecting them as well. That's the greatest risk. So that's how we've proceeded. So right now, um, the overwhelming uh, majority of long-term care homes have uh, received first doses of uh, either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine around the province, and that process will be completed shortly. A very significant portion of assisted living, uh, I believe about half of assisted living facilities and their staff have uh, been immunized, and that is based on uh, this, uh, the vulnerability of people and the obvious extraordinary vulnerability of people in long-term care. And then the next tier of vulnerability, people in assisted living. And that's why that priority has been put in place. As you can see in the first phase, uh, everyone over 80 will be uh, immunized and others, including staff, uh, staff uh, working uh, in home care and home support will be uh, immunized as well. So those are the reasons why there's different categories. I know that um, uh, in all assisted living facilities that are uh, in the same space as long-term care facilities, for example, they have all been done when the long-term care home is done. So that affects risk. And I should say that every time someone, including staff, every time someone, including your neighbor, is immunized, it makes uh, you considerably safer. The rules with respect to designating as an essential visitor, and these terms are important because for everyone in long-term care, I can say this personally, people know this, and, uh, and for everyone else, that uh, everyone, um, should feel that their their participation, their social life, their visiting of their loved ones is essential. But there's a definition of essential visitors that's been used uh, through the pandemic. We've made changes in that to accommodate people and to put in place an appeal process and consistent rules. The concern has been that those rules haven't been applied equally uh, and everywhere. But uh, our hope is, and the purpose of doing long-term care, first dose, then second dose, of assisted living first dose then second dose is to make those places safer and what you're going to see in the month of March is changes in the in uh, both social activity within care homes to allow more activity within the care home on a normal day and, and in addition to that changes with respect to visitation because once uh, people are made and residents are made safe in the immunization process, it's going to allow a lot of things to happen, including more visits from family members and loved ones and friends. So you're, that's the whole purpose of the immunization plan. And uh, the fact that we're immunizing as well essential visitors or people who are defined as essential visitors now is part of it as well. The idea is to keep people safe and to try and return to some sense of normalcy in long-term care, which is so important to the lives of people and to their overall health as soon as possible, is a main focus of our immunization plan. Mary, do you have a follow-up? I do. Thanks very much. And um, I think it might be directed towards Dr. Henry. Um, just wondering, you have talked about, you know, um, lifting the restrictions that is down the road in the fall. But what about the possibility of maybe from the island going over to somewhere like the Okanagan going camping? Right now, you know, the uh, suggestion is no non-essential travel. But what are the odds that maybe in July or August a family could head over there and, and maybe meet up with friends as long as they're still being responsible? Yeah, you know, I, I I want that as much as everybody. Um, I, I think we can look to last summer to have a better understanding of, of risk going down in the summer and more of our uh, more vulnerable elders, seniors being protected through vaccination. So I absolutely think there's opportunities for us to travel within BC this summer. I, I think it's not realistic to think there's going to be a lot of safe international travel by this summer. Um, that is something that's going to take quite a bit longer to uh, to achieve just because of uh, the situation around the world. But uh, I, I do believe we'll be able to get together in smaller groups responsibly, not having the big parties that we saw last summer that we uh, were associated with some of the uh, large spreading events in uh, parts of our communities. But uh, to to be responsible, to continue to, to use our layers of protection, but to have increased social interactions and, and to be able to go to these important places around BC for sure. We have time for one more today. The last questions will come from Susanna De Silva, CBC. 
Thank you very much. Um, I know you've talked about this a bit, but you've placed the extremely vulnerable people, those 69 and younger, in phase three, the ones with severe respiratory conditions, cancer patients, for instance. Um, We've heard a lot from this. A lot of these people in this group have reached out to us. We know that people in this category have been put on ventilators. Some of them have died. What do you say to those extremely vulnerable people watching right now who might be wondering why they're not in phase one or two? Uh, well, they, they're, it is all about marrying a vaccine that we have with risk that we have. So they are absolutely a group of people that are at risk and that we have taken special precautions to protect, whether it's in uh, communities, in their home, in their access to health care. And we need to continue those. Those are incredibly important. But they are in that group of people um, that as soon as we have vaccine available, we're going to make it available to that relatively small group of medically fragile people who, who are at that increased risk. I think we need to make it very clear, though, it is not everybody with asthma. It's not everybody with um, uh, with heart disease or with uh, uh, diabetes, which we also know do increase your risk of having um, more severe in, um, infection and ending up in hospital. For those people, age is still the overriding factor, and that's why it's so important for all of us to continue doing what we're doing to keep our numbers down. We've seen this in countries around the world. We see this in in other provinces. When we have a lot of transmission, even young people can get very sick, end up in hospital, and die from COVID. So all of us have to maintain what we're doing to keep our uh, transmission rates low to protect everybody. And we know that that's what protects those who are closest to us and to protect the people that we don't know as well. Susanna, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, and just to go back to, you mentioned the, in phase three that could be expanded to include some other frontline workers. Uh, you mentioned essential industries. Is this the type of place where the teachers, paramedics could be slotted in? Can you be as specific as possible about who you're looking at to include, include in that phase? And if you could please also answer in French. Sure, and and absolutely. This is, uh, you know, we we are basing the the foundation of the plan that we've talked about today, on on the two vaccines that are approved for use that we have some guarantees as much as we can from the federal government about amounts that we're going to receive, and focusing on the objectives which are to save lives and to prevent. Um, our hospital system, our health care system from being overwhelmed. We know that there are many people every day who go out and do their job that can't be done from home. So it's certain occupations that lead to increased risk of both getting COVID and transmitting COVID to others due to the interactions they have with the public or the fact that they they cannot work from home. And we know that's childcare workers. We know it's all of our educators, police, our fire services, correctional services, Um, many, many different groups of people who provide services are in grocery stores, agricultural workers, transportation. So there's a large group of of, uh, working age people, 16 to 64, um, who are in that group. And yes, we want to be able to provide, if we had unlimited supply of vaccine, we would be providing it as fast as we could to every other group as well. Right now, the vaccines that we have with the logistical challenges and the amounts that they have, um, we're focusing on our mass vaccination clinics. But if and when we have other vaccines that are available, we will be thinking and planning for uh, separate streams um, for uh, occupations and uh, essential workers, as we've described. So um, we are hopeful that that will happen, but we cannot plan based on hope. And uh, we're um, making our our strategies and putting them together and uh, if and when that is possible we will do that as quickly and as efficiently as we can. The Minister is going to answer. C'est de temps en temps difficile de le faire brièvement, mais, de, de, mais quand même, euh, je dirais euh, premièrement que euh, uh, ces groupes, uh, ces uh, travailleurs essentiels de notre société, que ce soit des enseignants, que ce soit uh, des gens qui travaillent dans le domaine, dans les industries de la nourriture, uh, sont tellement importants et nous le savons. Nous, cette, ce plan est fondé sur la, la, notre capacité de procurer uh, 
de part du gouvernement fédéral, les vaccins Pfizer et Moderna, qui marchent très bien, euh, surtout pour les personnes de troisième âge. Donc ça, c'est notre plan aujourd'hui. Si c'est possible, et il y a beaucoup de confiance, un peu partout dans le monde, mais si c'est possible d'avoir d'autres vaccins, que ce soit AstraZeneca, que ce soit euh, le vaccin de Janssen euh, ou Johnson Johnson, on, et on, si on a ces vaccins-là, on va pouvoir euh, euh, faire euh, et travailler avec des autres groupes, des autres euh, groupes d'employés, de travailleurs dans la société. Donc, ça, c'est important. Nous avons fondé euh, ce plan sur la science. On va continuer de le faire. Mais s'il y a d'autres opportunités, on va pouvoir euh, aider et vacciner ces autres groupes d'une manière différente. Il faut dire que les vaccins, euh, euh, les vaccins qu'on utilise, qu utilise normalement, euh, y compris bon, pendant cette période, on a vacciné euh, euh, à peu près 1 million mille personnes euh, depuis deux mois. Ce, genre, ce type euh, d'organisation va être utilisé euh, pour des autres groupes, euh, des groupes d'employés, des groupes dans des entreprises, etc. Donc, on va utiliser tout cela et euh, ces décisions, qui et où sont vaccinés, vont être décidées sur les recommandations sur, de notre comité sur l'immunisation dans, dans la province. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. And uh, let's see, you, you say anything? You good? You good? Thank you. Take care.